the Nigerian Economic Summit Group in its role as connector, dialogue partner, watchdog, and intervener. When you first start business, your target is to make your first million. Seeks to change the narrative and trajectory of the Nigerian economy. The Nigerian economy. Together with our partners, we're not just solving problems, but preventing them. Because when advocacy succeeds, the nation transforms for the better. But advocacy is for the strong. It takes fact-based inputs, resilience, partnerships, courage, and a lot of heroes. So be our hero. Subscribe to our channel, listen to our messages, and engage with us. Together, we can transform Nigerian lives, communities, and businesses. Welcome to the NESG Radio. So Nigeria's socioeconomic indicators do not paint a good picture. We have high inflation, high unemployment rates, Naira is at an all-time low, insecurity is at an all-time high. Our Human Development Index ranking is 161 out of 189 countries. But as we have heard here today, we are Africa's most populous nation with the smartest people and the greatest resources. Research has shown a causal link between an effective public sector and economic development. Indeed, Umuneli spoke very eloquently earlier about the need for the public sector to create an enabling environment for the private sector to thrive. Right now, is our public sector optimized for growth? We keep reforming, but not progressing. Where are we going wrong? So this afternoon, we're going to discuss the role that the public sector plays in driving economic development. We will touch on previous reform efforts and interrogate the reasons for their failure. We will talk about the role that the private sector and citizens can play in pushing for reforms. Our panel, our distinguished panel here today, is made up of um, the head of the Civil Service of the Federation, Dr. Fola Shadeyami Esson, Dr. Joe Abba, Country Director of DAI International Development, Mrs. Nkem Ilo, the CEO of the Public and Private Development Center, and virtually we have joining us Dr. Adeyemi Dikbeolu, Special Advisor to the President on Economic Matters, and Mr. Olusheng Onikinde, Director and Co-Founder of Budget. You are all very welcome. So I'm going to open up our discussions by giving each panelist two minutes to give your opening perspectives on the topic, and I will start with you, Dr. Yamieso. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Afoui. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the opening statement might sound quite depressing, but I don't think that um, that is a position we should sit by and uh, move at. I think that the major reason we're here today is to ensure that the public sector and the private sector work very, very well together. Over the years, my experience is that the private sector sits on a very high horse, condemning everything the public sector is doing without really understanding what the public sector is all about. So I think that a better collaboration between the public sector and the private sector is what will bring us out of the very poor indices you reeled out. The public sector on its own part is trying very hard to meet the expectations of the citizens. But if the citizens do not come together and have the, the expectations written out and there's an agreement between the citizens, the private sector, and the government. The government, on its own part, thinks we're doing very well. We're working very hard. And then the private sector says, we can't see what you're doing. 
So I think it's important for the two groups to sit down together, have an understanding. This is our expectations of the government. This is the way we want the government to work. And that way, you can now measure um, the, the output from the government to ensure that they are really doing what you want them to do. Thank you very much, Dr. Esson. So basically, you're asking for more public sector, private sector collaboration and engagement. Dr. Abba. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'll spend my, my two minutes by, uh, I'll, I'll spend the first one and a half minutes, I think, by borrowing from the words of others, and then I'll, I'll say a few things for about 30 seconds. So in the beginning, uh, 1959, I quote, our civil service is exceedingly efficient, absolutely incorruptible in its upper stratum, and utterly devoted and unstinting in the discharge of its many onerous duties. Our civil servants, government workers, and laborers um, bear uncomplainingly, without breaking down the heavy and multifarious burdens with which we have in the interests of the public, saddle them. And this is an epic of loyalty and devotion, of physical and mental endurance, and of a sense of mission on their part. From the bottom of my heart, I salute you all. Chief Obafemi Awulowo, 1959. Then we go to 1999. The world has witnessed a lot of changes since 1979 when I left office as head of state. Rather than being a source of innovation and productivity, our civil service and our public service has been turned into a haven for primitive accumulation and recycling of outdated ideas. One gets the impression that there is excessive bureaucratization or complication of simple procedures to inflict frustration, pain, and grinding poverty on people. The civil service needs to inspire hope and gender creativity to serve as a model institution. Reform is imperative. President Ulusegun Basanjo, May 29, 1999. Let's move another 10 years after that. I quote, our public service has metamorphosed from a manageable, compact, focused, trained, skilled, and highly motivated body into an overbloated, lopsided, ill-equipped, poorly paid, rudderless institution lacking in initiative and beset by loss of morale, arbitrariness, and corruption. National Strategy for Public Service Reforms, 2009. Let's go another 10 years, 2019. Uh, this is from the Federal Civil Service uh, Reform Strategy. It talks about limited staff training, low evidence of the training con that the training context is targeted and effective, no formal performance evaluation system, lack of performance measures, low adoption of digitalization. It goes on and on. So the question is what went wrong between 1959 and now? Well, one of the things that happened to us is oil. We discovered oil. But we're not the only country that, that discovered oil. Canada has the third largest oil reserves in the country, has one of the best uh, public services. We had military rule. Um, and military rule is based on command and control rather than due process, which the public service is there to do. But Rwanda went through uh, a, a similar uh, civil one has a really decent public service now. We had uh, Udoji reforms that recommended a number of reforms as well as a realization, uh, uh, reality in terms of pay. Government took the pay one, forgot about all the other ones about management by objectives and all those other things. And there was the Motala Mohamed Poch of 1975, there are the Dotton Phillips. Um, reforms, the Obasanjo reforms, to my mind, started a bit late and uh, suffered what I'll call infant mortality. We abandoned the merit principle in favor of uh, patronage um, and we've started to see the civil service and the public service not as a driver of growth but as a necessary evil. 
So if our public service is going to get any better, um, the day to get better is the day the politicians decide that it should get better. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Haba. You basically gave us a summary of the way that the Nigerian civil service has deteriorated over the years. Um, Mrs. Ilo. Um, thank you, moderator. My two minutes will be my take as a citizen of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Um, we've talked about the public expectation, having clear expectations from the public, what government should do, right? But if you look at Chapter 2 of the 1999 Constitution, the expectation is very clear. The primary purpose of government is security, bold, underlined, and welfare. I ask us as Nigerians, where are we when we come to security? Where are we when we come to welfare? I say this often to people around me. Myself, and Kem Delim Ilo, and my family, we've become a government. Why do I say this? The basic services of health and education, we provide. The cost of private education, we provide. The cost of electricity, energy, we provide. Um, solar panels, generators. The cost of um, water, we provide. Boreholes. We have even gone to provide, uh, what do you call it, road networks. Contributing to our estates to get the estates connected to that main road. And we are sitting in Abuja, we are sitting in Lagos, we are sitting in Port Harcourt and talking about this. We are getting to the time of Christmas where we all redeploy from all of these areas to the rural areas. I'm sure some of us are already buying our drugs, buying all of those things we need to be able to have the basic comforts. In all of these times, Dr. Joe has just listed all the reforms. Reforms are in the air. But for the ordinary citizens, it has to translate to outcomes. Outcomes that improve our welfare, outcomes that improve our socioeconomic well-being. You can't tell me that our budget has increased. We are increasing budget lines for security. We are increasing budget lines for education. When I still have to pay almost half a million to send one child to school for a session. That's my take, my two minutes point of view as a citizen of Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Bindo. Um, what you have basically said is that reforms are all well and good, but they need to translate to outcomes average citizen. Um, so we'll go to Dr. Dikbe Olu virtually. Dr. Dikbe Olu, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Please give us Bye. your two minutes opening perspectives. Thank you very much. Um, um, I, I thank you for the invitation to participate on this panel. Um, I think those who have gone before me have uh, really said a lot of interesting things. But I want to go back to basics. And the first basic is to say that both sides, public and private, need to have a clear understanding of what they expect from the public sector. So the, uh, we, we expect the public sector, of course, to lead in terms of articulating our plans and visions. Um, but um, we also then expect them to implement. And the question is that do they have those capacities? There's also the issue, of course, from this side of the public sector, whereby um, people are given positions of authority to regulate and then rather than regulate to support the private sector uh, in order that it can invest, create jobs, generate profits and pay taxes, um, they see it as the first point in which, of course, to extract their own pound of flesh. Um, of course, again, we all expect the public sector to play a very important role in helping to coordinate policies across different departments and between the public and the private sectors. But then the point I really want to bring out is that we all, I want to give a quote following from Dr. Abba. So uh, I remember that was once in the era of structural adjustment. Uh, someone asked uh, the civil servant about um, their performance. And they said, um, you pretend to pay us and we pretend to work. In other words, the point really is that if you don't have market-driven pay, how do you expect high-level performance? And I think a very good example of this was Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore, who, of course, Singapore has the best regulatory environment in the world. 
He paid a great deal of attention to his public service and he paid them the salaries commensurate up to today with the that paid in the private sector. I remember that uh, President Mandela, when he came to South Africa, was about to start off also. The first thing he said is that God will pay better service than the salaries. Otherwise, I'm going to give you the responsibilities to people that I'm paying peanuts to. So I think it's important as we talk about that, to be able to attract the best quality of people to the public service. We want a merit-driven public service, people who are highly trained. I remember in the era of the Western Civil Service that Dr. Joe Abba quoted, they used to send their public servants to Harvard so I know that Professor Adediji went to Harvard from the Western Region, Ambassador Shani went to Harvard, Professor, uh, Dr. Ijeweri went to Harvard, all on the MPA program. So there's some light at the end of the tunnel. I know that the Ike uh, Mokwele Foundation is helping us also to send our young people to Oxford to go and do the MPP program. So all hope is not lost. But I'm just saying that we have to contextualize what do we expect from one another and are we giving those that support to ourselves to enable us to achieve um, the objectives that we want to achieve. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Dufayoglu. To summarize, you basically said that we need to ensure we have the right people in the civil service if we want it to be effective, and to do that, we have to pay them well. Um, Mrs. Shane Onibinde, are you there? Can you give us your two minutes, please? All right, I'm here. My name is, thank you so much. It's a pleasure being here today, and I'm glad to join you virtually. I think my own position would be about uh, the size of funding. Also, uh, you know, talking about what Dr. Dipolo said, the size of funding that we have for the civil service in Nigeria, and the fact that that size of fund is not even enough um, to manage the civil service and put them in professionally. But we have had reports, and that has to do with streamlining the civil service and making adjustments so that we have a much more leaner service that is more efficient. I mean, there is the Oron Sai report. There is a um, report by Punch that says over 900 billion was allocated to agencies that the Oron Sai report uh, requested for reform. What, what worries me about Nigeria is the pace of our reforms. We know what to do. We are aware of how we need to make changes and adjustments. But we just not we choose not just to do it until maybe when our back is against the wall. Um, we choose not to diversify our public revenues until oil revenues stop making sense or stop being enough for the size of our, of our, of our expenditure outlay. Um, and the same thing we're doing um, when with the civil service. And if you look at the expenditure of government, apart from the debt service cost, there's, you know, there's inching upwards around 3.2 trillion. The next huge cost on the size of government is the civil service. And I always break that down. A chunk of that expenditure is defense, um, the police, uh, the interior ministry, the, the education and the health sector. Um, and, and, and those sectors deserve to be much more. They need to be paid much more. But the challenge I have is that we have a whole lot of places that we can make cuts and make adjustments so that we can give more to the sectors that are actually the basic principles or the basic uh, uh, ethos of government. And my own to me is just about we need to push hard on civil service reforms. Is this, now is the time that we do it because the resources are actually no longer hard enough. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nikbinde. Um, you basically touched on the need for urgent reform. So I'm going to go straight to Dr. Abba and um, put my first question. So as former Director General of the Bureau of Public Service Reforms, you have been at the forefront of reforms. You, you referenced a number of reforms in your introductory um, speech that ha have taken place, that have been implemented. Uh, and as Mrs. Ilo said, they have not resulted in any outcome. So can you please speak to the issues that have hampered previous reform efforts and, and with specific reference to the Orosai report, what is happening with that? I'll tell you what happened with the, <clears throat> with the Orosai report. So, so the Orosai uh, committee was commissioned in 2011. It produced its report in 2012. Um, it took government two years to come up with a white paper. And that white paper said, okay, we like these ones, these ones we don't like. We accept these recommendations, we, we reject these other ones. Um, the report actually has about four main parts. It says scrap some agencies, merge some agencies, stop funding some agencies, and change the laws of certain other agencies. So, um, so after the white paper was published, we were then preparing the 2015 budget. 
So I wrote to the secretary to the government of the federation and said, um, here are all the agencies we said we will no longer fund. Uh, can you please make sure they are not included in the budget for 2015? Um, the SGF, to his credit, wrote to the Minister of Finance and said, this is what we promised in the white paper. So please do not include funding for these agencies in the 2015 budget. The Minister of Finance dutifully did not include those agencies in the 2015 budget. And then somebody realized, ah, the government of the day is facing elections um, in, the next, in the next few months. And so it was, oh, okay, we haven't decided to sack anybody, so we're just going to pay them salaries, but we won't give them any overhead. So you had public servants sitting around for one year, uh, getting salaries basically for not doing anything. The new government came in with a promise, of course, to uh, reduce the cost of governance, uh, right-size uh, government and all of that. A number of meetings were had. We briefed the, the president a couple of times. Um, I was personally invited by the former chief of staff to, to the president on at least three occasions talking about how determined the president was to make sure that this report is, uh, is, 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 is implemented. Um, but let me just summarize it by saying that having worked for Tony Blair, who had campaigned on, uh, on a manifesto of public service reforms to come into government, I came into government researching the importance of political will. Um, I left government after four years researching the concept of when political will is not enough. Um, because because here, was, here was a president who had clearly expressed an intention to reduce the size of government, um, but then political will, believe it or not, is not limited to one person. Uh, the party needs to be interested. The cabinet needs to be interested. Uh, the, the, the public needs to be interested. Um, and so when you just have even, even the president as powerful as he is, if he doesn't have a constituency that can bring about those reforms, that political will, in truth, doesn't actually exist. That is exactly what's happened to the Orosan report. We make, we make every six months or so periodic announcements. Oh, the president has said go and implement. And then you hear nothing. And then six months later, there will be yet another announcement. That's why I started by saying the day our public services will work is the day our politicians want it to work. Thank you. Thank you very much for that comment, Dr. Ava. What you have basically said that political will is not enough. So as a populace, the private sector, citizens, we need to get engaged with government, which is what um, Dr. Yamiya Son was referring to. So Mrs. Ilo, you are at the forefront of driving citizen engagement for the public sector. Can you speak to Dr. Abba's comments and, and talk about what you are doing in your work and, and the impact that that has had? Yes, um, Dr. Abba is very, very accurate when he talks about um, political will not being enough. And I will just give one instance before I continue with what we do. Nigeria has committed to fiscal governance reforms. Nigeria committed to the Open Government Partnership. I sit on that table as the incoming co-chair for the non-state actors. And that OGP framework is a platform that harnesses not just public sector, but citizens, it also brings private sector into the room. So it's a holistic platform that you would expect would um, accelerate the kinds of reforms we want to see. But then again, political will is not enough. It's not enough for the president to make that commitment at the London Anti-Corruption Summit, to come back and speak to the press and have that done. We still have heads of departments, heads of ministries that need to sit at that table and collaborate with private sector and the public. Um, in the course of the work we do, we monitor health and education sector, right? It's around public procurement. We know that public procurement is the engine room for the budget expenditure. Half of, more than 90% of our money goes through the public procurement process. And it's 
very frustrating and disheartening when we see how much is committed in the budget. We see how much we, we, they release through the account the general's office. And then you go to communities and you can barely speak to the provision of basic healthcare facilities like the primary health care. We know um, a couple of years ago, um, His Excellency the President made a commitment, very strong commitment to basic health care, provision of primary health care centers in every one. That's not happening how many years down the line. It speaks to, it goes beyond the President's office, to the ministries, to the departments, to the agencies, to those individuals who sit at the table that approve those contracts that approve those processes and you go to the site, you see that the contract says awarded, funds have been released, but nothing exists. That's what, that's what it speaks to. We talk about citizens' engagement. Citizens cannot engage without accessibility, open accessibility to data, open accessibility to data that is useful, and an opportunity for a feedback mechanism. A lot of us here probably watch Big Brother Africa. We see what the cameras do. The cameras are everywhere, right? That's what the eyes of every citizen is. There are those cameras that are everywhere. But if you say citizens should participate, citizens should be involved, but you don't give an avenue for citizens to give you feedback on what they have seen in their communities. Um, just think about one of those communities way inside one of the states. They don't have that opportunity to give that feedback and have that feedback work and bring results, you, you, you create a situ situation for erosion of trust. Nothing happens in Nigeria without a context. That's, that's some of the issues we find. So we have this laudable big ideas, reforms. Um, take for instance, we're talking about performance evaluations for ministries, the departments and the agencies. That performance evaluation would the expectation is that there is an accountability to citizens about what the ministries have, desired, have determined to do, what their objectives are. That accountability for Nigeria has always been focused on oh, corrupt practices, or we're trying to limit, plug financial um, leakages. But accountability is also the positive, right? Reinforcing public trust through disclosure of data that people are able to use and bring back to you and say, this is what I have found. How do we work together with the private sector? How do we work together with this ministry to make sure that our services are joined? And one more thing, I know I'm spending a bit of time, is that collaborative mechanism. Our structures are built to be silos. The Ministry of um, Works, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Works, the Ministry of Housing, they are holding their information because each ministry is accountable. So there, there is an urge to protect themselves. But we forget that public services are collaborative. So I want to build a primary health care center in, let's say, Ojiri, in Enugu State. But there is a role that needs to connect to that public health care center. So the health care center exists, but whenever there is a flooding or we have heavy downpour, you find women pregnant women coming down from bikes two miles from the healthcare center wading through the dirty flooded water to get to that primary healthcare center. What's the value of the primary healthcare center if I am unable to assess it as a pregnant woman? We need those collaborative mechanisms across MDAs, across agencies, and that's one of the things that I think will drive our reforms if we need to go to where we are going to. Thank you. Dr. Yemi Asson, Mrs. Ilo posed a lot of questions that, as head of service, you should have answers to. Um, so in your capacity as head of service, you must have come across some of these issues that, that she discussed, the silos, the lack of information. Um, what are the reforms, what are the steps that you are taking to build a more effective civil service? And speaking to um, Dr. Abba's point, have you come against any resistance in terms of political will, and how are you working around that? Yes, I, before I talk about the reforms, um, I just want to go back to the collaborations I talked about, especially with the CSOs. If at the beginning of the day, the CSOs say that we want to see these data, please make your information available on your website, and these are the things we need to see. 
make sure your department gives us data on one, two, three, four, five, six at the end of the day. Then that is collaboration. It's not that you go at the end of the day, you want to monitor, and then you're looking for data. And maybe the ministry, the, 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 the ministry's uh, program does not include some of the data you want. So at the beginning of the conversation, there must be an agreement that this is what we need from a particular MDA so that that MDA can provide it. That is the first thing. The second thing is that the understanding of the structure that we run in Nigeria. We run a federal system. And so when we're talking about primary health care centers, what the federal government tries to do at that level is just intervention. You know, when the federal government sees that these things are not there, so they try to intervene. And most of the time, the intervention comes from a collaboration between the federal government and the state government. Where do you need these things? Where should we place these facilities? So, you know, that, that's why I said the understanding of how government works is key. You know, before we can now talk about um, accountability and what we're doing. Now, on the reforms, the Office of the Head of Service, since 2015, with this new administration, has been running the Federal Civil Service Strategy and Implementation Plan. We started with the first one, which ran from 2015, 2017, sorry, to 2020. And now there's a successor plan, which will run from 2021 to 2025. And most of these lessons, when we're developing the 2025 plan, for example, we sat down with civil society organizations and we said, tell us the kind of civil service you want to see. Tell us what we're doing wrong so that we can look inwards and try to correct ourselves. And we had, unfortunately, she wasn't there, but we had a very robust discussion. And we said, look, tell us if it is data you want, let us have the set of data you need. If it is um, efficiency, come out with details so that going forward we can include it in the plan. And so now this plan that we're working on 2021 to 2025 has six major pillars. And like we've all said, the most important and number one pillar is capacity development and talent management. The, the, the service over the years has been known for capacity development. We've seen several cases where civil servants have been poached on because they're well trained and they move to the private sector because of course the pay in the public sector is not as good as that of the private sector. So those are the things we're still grappling with because you train your civil servants very well and then they move to the private sector. Then you have to start all over again, you know, and you, the circle just continues. Once there's a public servant that is well trained, the private sector pushes on them. The second thing we're working on now is the uh, performance management, which she spoke about. Over the years, the old performance system that we've had is really not, I'll be very sincere with you, doesn't measure any kind of performance. And we've gotten feedbacks that this doesn't measure any kind of performance at all. That is why we're working on a new performance management system where every civil servant will get his own objectives, tasks, based on the objectives of his or her ministry. So you have the ministry's objectives, what the ministry wants to attain, and then your own tasks and objectives and targets you now get from that MDA's um, objective. So you are measured on a monthly, on a quarterly basis, what have you been able to do concerning the, your own targets to meet the overall objective. And we, we also will have a session where we talk about the resources. 
you know, everybody thinks that um, civil servants have everything they need to work with, but are not working. That is not the truth. You give somebody an assignment of, in the last two years, I've had to sometimes, you know, go and blackmail some of my friends just to get things to work with. Fortunately for us, the collaboration with Aikimo Kodi Foundation has helped the civil service a great deal because the resources that the civil service does not have, the foundation is able to provide. So we are also looking out for the private sector to come and work with us in that way. I'll give a story. The first time we invited the chairman of the foundation to come and sit at an interview we were conducting um, for permanent, for directors that wanted to become permanent secretaries. Initially, he didn't want to come, but I said, no, you need to come and see the quality of people that we still have in service. And so he said he was going to come. At the end of the promotion, our interview session, he came back to me and said, Madam, you still have a lot of good people in service. And I said, yes, they are there. But most of the time, they are incapacitated. They, there's nothing um, to work with. We're struggling with budgeting, just like every other MDA. The resources of government is limited. You know? So that is why we feel that the private sector should collaborate much more with the public sector. When you understand the issues that the public sector has, and in one way or the other, you can help the private sector or the public sector to develop, then it, the, the, the good goes round. But I can assure you that we still have very good, committed civil servants in the service today, and we're waiting for collaboration. I will put this next question to you as well, Dr. Yemi Asson. So, um, the Governance and Institutions Policy Commission of the NESG is focused on facilitating the overhaul of public institutions, strengthening partnerships with the private sector, and measuring government performance. So, talking about um, providing access to information, one of the key uh, outputs of the GIPC is going to be the Public Sector Performance Index. So how can you please speak to how that will allow the private sector, allow citizens to become more engaged with what is actually going on in the um, public sector? And also how, as co-chair um, public sector of the GIPC, you would like to encourage more private sector involvement um, with, with your activities in the civil service? Civil service is actually very, very excited about um, the work the GIPC is doing. Um, because most of the time, um, the public sector is working, but there are no measurements, there are no agreed indices, there's no measurement. So we really don't know if we're doing well, we just um, wake up and uh, we are always at the court of the... Of the uh, press saying the public, maybe one public servant does something wrong and then the reaction we get is that all civil servants, all public servants are corrupt or you know so it's, it's at, sometimes it gets depressing and it discourages the, the civil servants that are actually hard working so this is a very very welcome development honestly we the Office of the Head of Service, we're very, very excited about it because it's an opportunity to showcase what we're doing. And like I said before, the involvement of the private sector and the civil society organizations in coming up with the indices is key. You know, we need to have that broad um, perspective so that we know what the civil society organizations want to measure us on and what the private sector also wants to measure us on. And that way we can um, rearrange our priorities and make sure that we are able to deliver on those indices. So I think it's a very, very good thing. We're not shying away at all from it. We 
want actually um, to, to go full force with the performance index and we're happy that uh, GIPC um, is doing this and we also are encouraging um, other, like I said before, other private organizations to please come and partner with the public sector. You know, once most of the time they think that um, the private sector is so corrupt and um, they don't want to involve, but that is not true. I think um, uh, I came up with a foundation and will one day come and tell us all what the experience has been working with the public sector. I don't think it's as bad as uh, everybody else wants, wants to believe. So I think that that is actually a good starting point and we encourage um, other private organizations to please join in and join forces with the public sector. The government alone cannot carry the load of what we are expecting. You know, the, the expectation of the public sector is quite high. And unfortunately for us now, uh, the, the economic situation, um, the government cannot fund everything that we need. Um, so we also need the, the, the private sector to come and join in and to see that we're not as greedy or as corrupt or as bad as people want to paint us to be. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yamiazan. I can personally attest from my work with, with your office and the office of the head of the civil service of the Federation to the integrity of all the, the permanent secretaries that I have um, personally engaged with. So I will put um, my next question to um, Mr. Sheo Nigminde uh, virtually. Um, so we talked about the proposed public sector performance index and the head of service was quite optimistic as to how that would enable her office to better prioritize its work and its strategies. Um, but you have experience with budget and so has, has it all been positive? Um, trying to provide information to citizens. What has been the response from the public sector and also from citizens with having that access to that information? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, it's been a mixed uh, situation. So we have some time, and it all depends on the individual most times. Um, we've had some fortune working with maybe the budget office, the Ministry of Finance, and they provide such information for us. Um, for example, a lot of people don't know that Nigeria's spending to some extent is made public. Um, is on the gov, um, open um, the open treasury.gov.ng and you can access it. The budget is on the budget office of the federation, and so we just need more citizen actors doing the work uh, beyond budget to make it more simple and more accessible. And we need more citizens more interested. It's just that most times when you bring up criticisms to government or you say uh, things are not working right, uh, it looks as if maybe you have a political coloration or maybe possibly you don't understand that reforms takes time or you're speaking in an idealistic sense. The, and unlike the, the, the title of this panel, it's called the, the urgency of now. We are running out of time. By the time you look at um, the way our face to recessions in the last five years, we've um, had... Um, Unemployment is rising and, and inflation is off the roof. The currency is getting losing value, it's insecurity. We're running out of time. And that's why the urgency is that we brought forms of you know, across, across the structure. We do fiscal reform. We can continue to run our tax architecture the way it is right. We can continue um, to have. Um, um, what we call the fragmentation of capital projects. We have over 11,000 capital projects in the federal government budget. Or why would you execute 11,000 projects in a single year? Why not just do 2,000 projects and be much more focused about how you put your resources in? There is still the politicization of everything. It must all go around. Whereas we know that such systems are grossly inefficient. And so for us at budget, we want government to have, we, we've seen a bit of work around transparency. Um, 
uh, but we think with that there's still a work that needs to be done. But where the missing link is is accountability. There is still no structural way in which the government responds to the people when issues of uh, abuse of resources or under under investment in capital sectors or even under delivery of projects gets to happen. I mean, and we see all of that. Schools not being built, hospitals not being um, up to date, and we're able to channel of that and we write the government. Nobody's fully really even responsive to that. So what we advocate is a permanent responsive mechanism that the government has, I mean, especially when it comes to budget spending um, as much as possible. But like I said, um, we've had fortune of working with some great people in government. And we have also had this fortune you know, <laughs> of working with some few people, especially maybe most of them in the National Assembly. But we, we count it that democracy is a journey and, and we'll just keep moving gradually uh, until we get to that destination. Thank you very much, Mr. Nikbinde. Uh, my next question is to Dr. Dikwe Olu. Um, are you there, sir? Very much so. Okay, so you heard all the different comments about trying to get the private sector more involved. Um, you are in charge of the public-private partnerships in the GIPC. Um, the head of service has indicated that she is very willing um, to work with private sector entities to engage more with the private sector, to engage more with citizens. What are the steps that you think that the government can take um, to open up and basically um, create the accountability frameworks that will give the private sector and citizens more comfort in engaging with the public sector? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I think, first of all, I think when we're talking about accountability frameworks, I suspect that we're talking first, of course, about the use of authority for the purposes for which it is used. We're talking about the use of the resources uh, for the purposes uh, for which uh, they are given. And we are, of course, also talking about ensuring credible commitment so that if you make promises, uh, those promises are kept. I think in that regard, one of the ways that the private sector can help, and indeed civil society can also help, is to continue to actually maintain those pressures. If I may go into a bit of history again, I remember the United States Civil Service in the mid-19th century, I think it was, was hopeless, so to speak. It was just all the appointments were by patronage. Um, they just appointed people to the civil service by patronage. But it was the pressure from civil society uh, the private sector at that time that led to what they called the Pendleton Act. And that act basically helped to create a civil service structure and to determine what positions required to be recruited by merit and things like that. So I'm saying first and foremost that the accountability framework would be very much helped by the private sector, public sector, actually demanding this uh, private sector, civil society, actually demanding these things of government. I think it's a good, it's a good start. I think the other attempt, which is important, is the attempt to measure, to find out how are we doing against some of these basic metrics, which is why this, um, the index that is being developed is very, very important, because then you have the uh, benchmarks by which you can see whether you're making progress on critical areas relating to um, accountability. But, but mostly, and the head of service has made reference to this, uh, there's the collaborative spirit, the spirit of saying we're in this together, the spirit of saying if we're in this together, by what means can I support you? Can I mentor some people, for instance? Can I post some people uh, to the civil service to understand how it works? Can I provide some capacity to the civil service over the short run to help fill some gaps? In other words, collaborative, helping to sustain processes, understanding that uh, there are challenges, there are revenue challenges, there are fiscal challenges, but willing to put some support in place. I think by and large, uh, we should be able to, to get there. Thank you very much, Dr. Dupolu. However, we are still faced with the issue of political will. So you can try to, you know, engage as many private sector entities as possible, have the discussions, um, open up your books, let people see, but the civil service is still over bloated. Um, all the recommendations that um, Dr. Abba outlined have not yet taken place. So, so how do you work around that? How do you counter that? As head of service, what is it that you are trying to do to create a more effective service while um, dealing with political will. 
political will is really not an insurmountable challenge. I think that it is just um, the will and the ability um, to go, to be persistent is, is what is key. Um, there's nobody that once you explain the issues surrounding a particular matter to and you keep going back, you keep going, you will need to do this. We need to do this. I'm not giving up. I think um, sometimes uh, it's easy for us to give up when we uh, hit some roadblocks. But I've learned that um, being dogged and being persistent um, most of the time, um, sooner or later, uh, um, the, 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 all the politicians see the good in what we do. The Orosoye um, report that uh, Dr. Abba was talking about, for example, um, when Mr. President said we should revisit the report, for example, and he gave the assignment to both the Office of the Head of Service and the Office of the Secretary to the government. The Office of the Head of Service looked at uh, what the way forward should be. Because like you said, the report came out in 2012 and a lot had happened even after that report. So the recommendation from the Office of the Head of Service was that there should be two committees. Um, one to look at what has happened even after the Oron Soye Committee and then the second committee should now come out with an implementation strategy for the Orosoye uh, Committee. And I'm happy to say that with a lot of persistence, a lot of reminders, um, the, the two committees uh, have started sitting now. And so it's, 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 uh, it's not as fast as we thought it would be, but you know, we kept going back, reminding, uh, we need to do this, we need to do this. And, 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 and so... And I also think that another thing that we need is when we're having, I, I was actually curious when I came in um, this morning to see how many uh, members of the National Assembly were, were here. And uh, I'm not sure, I wasn't here for the opening, but I don't know how many were invited and how many actually came. You know, this kind of discussions are key. You know, for, for, for the public sector especially, um, because as politicians, they need to understand how the system works. And it is just by engaging and engaging and engaging, they're not giving up. Sometimes it might not be as fast as we want it to be, but if we keep at it, and, um, we will definitely see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, Dr. Abba, would you like to comment on that? Are you hopeful about the outcomes of the committee? Oh, I'm always, uh, I'm always hopeful. Uh, it's, it's in my nature to, it's in my nature to be hopeful. But I'm also quite realistic. Um, to my knowledge, since 2015 that the current administration came in, the Bureau of Public Service Reforms has. Uh, revised and updated the Orosorian report findings at least three times and submitted it to government. And so I'm very hopeful that this fourth time um, <laughs> something will actually uh, something will actually happen. Um, the, the reference made to the members of the National Assembly is also an important one. Um, I wish they were here so that I could also tell them that you don't actually have to create a new agency for every new law you pass. Um, at the time the Orosoye report was done, it, it enumerated 541 agencies. Uh, for the 2019 budget, we made provision for 1,100 federal bodies. Uh, that is a doubling um, a, within, that, within that period. Um, we don't have a champion 
for public service reforms. I see Governor Rufai here. Uh, when he was in the federal government, he was actually the lead minister for, for public service reforms. We don't have that person. What we have instead is, is a Ministry of Police Affairs whose functions I clearly don't understand. Because we have an Inspector General of Police that doesn't report to a minister, reports direct to the President. We have a Ministry of Interior. We have a, uh, the, the responsibility for the appointment, promotion and discipline of the police is with the police service commission. So I would rather have a minister driving reforms than a minister of police affairs. I'm sorry if I, if I appear to be picking on a particular minister. But the point is to, is to show you that there are things to be done across the board, right? From, from the presidency to the cabinet to the National Assembly to, um, to the legislature to civil society organizations we all just need to say, look, we want a better public service and it needs to start now. I think, I think the, the, if you look at what was achieved just between 2003 and 2007, it just shows you what is possible. Between that time, we now had, a, we had an independent federal inland revenue service. We had, uh, we had the EFCC. We moved from uh, a defined pension scheme to a contributory uh, pension scheme which meant that people are, at least can now get a pension because before now you were promised a pension whether you actually get it or not was another matter but at least now with the contributory pension scheme you can get that kind you you, you are short of of getting a pension we have the reforms in the um, in the federal capital territory administration which we are all uh, aware of we had um we had reforms in our financial management systems, and all of that was largely achieved within four years. And, and people say, okay, the difficulty with implementing the Orosome report is, oh, all of these agencies are set up by law, and so you need to go and change them individually by law. But the, the Petroleum Industries Act has shown that you can abolish four ministries with one act. So, so, so if you just bring forward the Public Service Act, that says all of the following ministry uh, agencies are now abolished. This agency and that agency is, is now, you just need one act. And so, and so it is not enough that the president continues to make this announcement and make these charges. I work, I, I lead an organization and I know that if I ask for something to be done and it is not done, it is very, very clear to me what I need to do next. Thank you. So, Dr. Abba, the gains that were made between 2003 and 2007, are you saying that they were made because you had a responsible minister for reforms or there was more political will? What, what, what is the difference between now and then? You, you, had, you had somebody who was responsible for driving the, the change. And then you had about three or four ministers. You had the Minister of Finance, you had the uh, the, the chairman of FCC, you had the governor of the central bank, you had a few people who, who were like-minded about what needed to be done and who were seen to speak with the voice of the president. So, so, so you need that and there's no country where you've had successful reforms where you didn't have at least one person sitting at the cabinet who was seen to, be, to speak with the voice of the president. So if you, if you go to Malaysia, for instance, the person leading the reforms gets a report from every minister every Friday with which he goes to see the president. So if a minister is not doing anything, the president gets to know every Saturday because everybody gives this report on, 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 on Fridays. And so it was very, very good to see. I, I was fortunate to moderate a panel uh, I think a couple of weeks ago, head of service, when uh, the, the performance of ministers was being, was being assessed, and Kim was also on the, on the panel. And it was great to, to see that because, you know, in 2012, when we first did this uh, ministerial performance scorecards, we came in 2013 to assess it, and, and all the ministers said, ah, we didn't know what we were signing then, no. We didn't really know that you come back and hold us to account for it. And by the way, you didn't release 
all the money you sent. So how do you expect us to perform? So I was particularly pleased, actually, that ministers were giving accounts uh, at, at, uh, two weeks ago. And I hope that this can cascade into, you know, ministers holding PEMSEX to account, PEMSEX to directors, all the way down. That's when you will have a meaningful performance system that is linked to what the government of the day wants to achieve. Thank you very much to all the panelists. To sum up, we have tried to reform before. We are still trying. But the issue of political will is something that has to be addressed. It is important for the private sector and citizens to engage with the public sector and push for reforms. And most importantly, we need to appoint a minister of reforms, as recommended by Dr. Joe Abba. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to our content today. Remember to subscribe to the NESG Radio. Follow us across all social media channels and visit our website, www.nesgroup.org forward slash NESG Radio. NESG in the national interest.